The January 6th committee will soon return for what could be their final public hearing after they announced they would postpone a hearing scheduled for Wednesday due to Hurricane Ian. Roughly two months since its last presentation, the committee is expected to present to the American public new information, including footage obtained from Danish filmmakers who were embedded with longtime Trump ally Roger Stone for two years. This footage showing Stone, among other Trump allies, were planning to declare a 2020 Trump victory regardless of the election's results, weeks before the votes were even cast. And there is still more that the committee is gathering. On Thursday, the committee finally interviewed, in person no less, Jenny Thomas, the conservative activist and wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. In the weeks after the election, Ginny Thomas corresponded with Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, as well as Trump coup architect and lawyer John Eastman, who wrote the memo laying out the fake electors scheme. She also contacted multiple state lawmakers, urging them to put aside their state's results and choose their own fake slate of Trump electors. Ginny Thomas's testimony will be yet another puzzle piece to fit into this massive investigation. Since July of 2021, the January 6th committee and their team of investigators have undertaken a colossal effort to piece together the timeline of the Capitol attack and the weeks leading up to it. Over the course of nine public hearings, the committee has meticulously detailed the plot to overturn the 2020 election, as well as the interconnected web of conservative activists, rioters, far-right militia groups, congressional and state lawmakers, government officials, Trump associates, and the White House itself, all of whom were tied together by a singular mission to keep Donald Trump in power. Now, for the first time, we get an insider look at the inner workings of the 1-6 investigation. Former Trump-endorsed Republican Congressman Denver Riggleman worked for months as a senior technical advisor to the January 6th committee. He stepped down from his role in April after assisting the committee for eight months. This week, he published a new book, The Breach, the untold story of the investigation into January 6th. Now, the committee did not approve of Mr. Rigelman's book. In a statement through its spokesman, they said, in his role on the select committee staff, Mr. Rigelman had limited knowledge of the committee's investigation. Since his departure, the committee has run down all the leads and digested and analyzed all the information that arose from his work. Despite the committee's disapproval, the book represents the most in-depth look we have had yet into the 1-6 investigation and the data behind it. Joining me now is Denver Riggleman. Denver, thank you so much for being here. I really want to have our viewers understand with specificity, because I don't really think that it's come out in some of the interviews that you've done recently. What was your role as a senior advisor for the committee? What did your team specifically do? Because from what I've read, I mean, it was a serious deep dive, a reconstruction using phone records and messages and documents. And it really wasn't just you sitting back and telling people, hey, maybe you want to look into that. So I really want them to understand what you had to do when you were there. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Thanks for having me. The committee brought me on based on 20 years of counterterrorism data analytics and something called non-kinetic targeting. And what I did with, you know, the Office of Secretary of Defense, Air Force Intelligence and other agencies is I had to build data or fusion centers to, build, to put a bunch of data together. I'm going to try to do this really simply, you know, put a bunch of data together to find out what people were doing, where they were, uh, maybe what they were going to do in the future, almost go predictive. So what I did was I actually wrote, uh, you know, the contracts and created the call detail record team, and uh, which looks at the phone records. And I created the open source intelligence team and had to do all the boring contracting stuff and costing and then build the teams out and then support, you know, whatever data um, that the committee needed, but also to push forward with data and build new types of ways of fusing all this, you know, spectacular data together. You know, Denver, most people might remember that you were a congressman, but like you just said, you have decades of experience in counterintelligence. In your book, you mention the monster, and I put that in quotes, right, which was essentially the map of who was calling who. When people read your book, which I know they're going to do, they're going to find out stuff like Roger Stone stonewalling you guys getting his call records, and you had to kind of start from one end of the spectrum and work your way backwards. But you write in your book 
that each line on the monster represented an incoming or outgoing communication from a call detail record. If you zoomed in, you could see each line crisscrossing the white screen. Zooming out, the monster looked like a lopsided hexagon with six major connected hubs, representing each of our five categories and the unaffiliated rioters. It had a strong skeleton of link lines woven between each node. They were all connected. Everyone was linked. Denver, this sounds like a massive undertaking, but who were the gravity centers in the monster? Yeah, when you look at the massive amount of work that we had to do, what you looked at, Katie, was about 20 million lines of data. Right. And so when you have that much data, you have to do new ways of looking at it. So when you look at these hubs or people that had a lot of connections, you're looking at Oath Keepers, you're looking at Proud Boys. And obviously they would because we had a lot of DOJ charged defendants that were in a link monster. But what got crazy with centers of gravity, if you had call records, was people like rally planners, Trump associates, you know, people who had close ties to Trump and the family that were actually in contact with rally planners and at times maybe just one connection away from Proud Boys or Oath Keepers. And that's what was so important about this. And I hope it excites the American public when it comes to data that the committee's on the right track. I, this book was added, and I know people had a little bit of worries beforehand, but I don't think they do now since they're calling it. But those hubs and those centers are people like Tario, Enrique Tario, which I really, when you look at the, the cluster that we saw on him and the people that he was connected to, it was absolutely incredible. And his connections through, you know, one or two, two hops over to Rhodes and to other right-wing extremist groups. And I think it's that, it's that second and third tier that I wanted to show the public that really does add to the committee and what they're doing at the top tiers. And I think that's really where, you know, domestic terrorism happens and where radicalization happens. Yeah, and that's also something that you were concerned about during your time in office. You were concerned about the radicalization of America, the rise in the prominence of groups like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers. Just a reminder to our viewers that Enrique Tarios, who's currently in custody down in Miami, where I am, in the Federal Detention Center, is facing charges, as well as Stuart Rhodes, who began his trial this week in D.C. You know, Denver, there has been, um, like, I, I read what the spokesperson for the 1-6 committee said. I have a lot of respect for the 1-6 committee, Denver, and the work that they've done and they continue to do. Um, but I would ask you, what grade would you give the committee so far? What are you worried about might have been left on the table by the committee? I've read um, that you had a concern about what I call siloing maybe the compartmentalization of research and investigative efforts and the inability to maybe weave them together that would give a little bit more of a holistic view that would have assisted you, for example, during your eight-month investigative tour of duty with the committee. So do you have a concern that perhaps the 1-6 committee might have left something on the table in terms of chasing down leads? Sure, you always have a concern as a you know military intelligence officer and somebody who's done this, but the concern wasn't from the committee leaving stuff on the table purposefully or anything. What I wanted to be additive is that we're in a new forever war, which is the information war. And if you look at really tiny pieces of data, if you have 20 million pieces of data, you need the resources and the expertise in order to get it done at every single level. And I want to give you an example from your own network, Katie, if that's okay. You know, we released the sure. book. You know, you talk about a little piece of data. We had Kelly Sorrell attempting to actually text the White House, right, to a landline. People are like, well, what does that mean? Katie, you don't have to be an intelligence officer to say, well, maybe she knew somebody before. It's that easy. So what do we do? So I put that in the book because when you have somebody who's been charged with conspiracy, an Oath Keeper, attempting to text the White House, it suggests prior communication. That simple. Well, NBC reached out to Kelly Sorrell and said, should she like to text Andrew Giuliani? So if you think about this, we have a White House aide in November and December, right? We found that she was trying to text people at the White House. She admitted to it, right? So now we have a White House aide and the son of Rudy Giuliani texting with an Oath Keeper. So we just shook the data tree. And that is not even a call. That's nothing. That is one little piece of data. That is a actual code on a call detail record, a specific number, an alphanumeric code that says it was a text. And then it says it couldn't be completed because this person was texting a landline. So now we have Kelly Sorrell and Oath Keeper texting Andrew Giuliani. That wasn't known. That's not because the committee's not doing a great job. That's because we need a new way of approaching the information warfare battle space. This is a book about speed. This isn't a book about, you know, thoroughness. Fat, slow and steady might win the race, but fast and steady is so much damn better, you know.
Yeah, and Denver, to your point, do you think that the committee should have asked for more bodies on this investigative committee, more money to be able to chase down more of this information? I mean, Kelly Sorrell was the general counsel of the Oath Keepers. She has, as you've noted, already been indicted herself. Andrew Giuliani, as a reminder to our viewers, worked in the White House. I'm not sure if you call that worked, but worked in the White House during the Trump administration. I mean, you're, this is a very direct link you're talking about right now. And I'm sure it is an example of other connections that you found during your work. Do you think maybe more answers could have been obtained if the 1-6 committee had asked for more? Yeah, I actually do. Um, I think when you're looking uh, at data, asking for more is usually better if you have the systems to do it. But what I outline in the book is the committee is handcuffed in a way I don't think the American public realize. They have authorities problems they got to get through, right? This is not a criminal investigation. This is a public trust investigation. So what you have to do is you have to expand the amount of data you get, and you have to actually build correlative tools in real time. So we were actually trying to fly the plane while we were building it. So the committee had a lot of issues they had to do, and I had the pleasure of being, you know, not an elected member of me. I'm a former congressman, but that's just my cover, Katie. You know, I was an intelligence and data officer. Mm -hmm. So I might have had only done the data, but the data is the biggest part of any of the investigations because we are in a new world where people are going to use these techniques in order to maybe try this again. And what I try to do is give a predictive look at data and how it can be used in the future. And that's why I thought that this book was additive, not subtractive. I still believe that. And the people reading the book are seeing that. People know how I feel about the committee. You know, I think they get all the credit. They get everything they deserve. And I think that's what we need to look at is that the committee is in a very good place, but we can always do more because this is a new world. This is what I've done for 20 years. And if my limited knowledge is 20 years of counterterrorism, data analytics, non-kinetic targeting, kinetic targeting, you know, deploying to multiple war zones, I'm okay to use that. I'm just good at this, but I can take a little tiny bit of data and do a lot with it. But that is credit to the data teams that they allow me to build. But yeah, we needed to be resourced a little bit more. And I said that in the book, but I don't know if the committee really, they know the, the authorities' problems and what they're allowed to do is very difficult to do an investigation that deep. And to that point, Denver, you mentioned a few minutes ago, slow and steady may win the race, but there definitely was a limited charter for this committee. There was a limited scope of time that was afforded to this committee to get its job done, to achieve its mission. And I, you know, today, the committee finally interviewing Jenny Thomas. Um, again, not to Monday morning quarterback, but it's taken a long damn time to get Jenny Thomas to sit down. Lord knows what she's saying. Um, I appreciate it's an in-person interview. It wasn't pursuant to a subpoena. In your 60 Minutes interview, you called Jenny Thomas's text to Mark Meadows an eye-opener. I'd say that's an understatement, Denver, if anything. <laughs> how, how important is it, though, to carefully look at the role of somebody like Jenny Thomas in all of this? It's very careful, and it's not just the text messages that look like QAnon has saturated every level of the GOP, right? That's, that's sort of known now. What got me is the people she said she was talking to. Now, either, you know, she's not quite understanding who she's talking to, not understanding the topics, or she actually is, right? So if you forward a text message from the chief of staff of a congressional representative and you're the wife of Supreme Court justice, that should be very interesting to the American people. If you're saying that you're talking to Jared Kushner, that should be very interesting to the American people. Those questions, you know, should be asked. What, what are you talking about there? Also, when you put together not only the text messages, but the emails that have been uncovered through FOIAs or through the committee, you now have her almost seen following the plan of Peter Navarro and his, you know, immaculate deception document where she's sending emails to some of the states that are outlined and maybe one of the craziest, weirdest documents that are out there. So now you have the wife of Supreme Court justice forwarding emails from chief of staff from Congress saying she's talking to the Trump administration and also in contact with John Eastman, as you, and you know John Eastman's role. So, you know, this is very concerning because if you can link her to other legal strategies or even to her husband, you just don't want all three branches of government, you know, involved in a coup-like movement. And if you identify that, that, that again, the American people should be asking as a public trust, and why does this individual have that access and allow to do those things and say those things? You know, you got the First Amendment. She's allowed to have her opinion. But the, if the opinion is, you know, a little bit based on sort of crazy conspiracy theories, that again, that's something we should be digging into. Former Congressman Deborah Riggleman, sadly, I have run out of time. I insist 
that you come back because there's a million and things that I'd like to talk to you about, including QAnon, your own family's kind of personal journey on what has happened through your service. I will tell everybody, run, do not walk to go get The Breach, the untold story of the investigation into January 6th as it is now out on sale. Denver, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Katie, for having me.